In today's video, I've outlined 10 things that I think beginners and intermediate poker players get wrong day in, day out. I see this all the time. By fixing these leaks, by learning these 10 rules for better poker, you're going to improve your win rate. I have no doubt about it. For all of our paid stuff, it's carrotcorner.com. But in the meantime, enjoy this poker content. All right, guys, we have quite a bit to get through today. I have 10 rules here. 10 rules for better poker, you could say. Something like that, we'll title it. I'm coming at you in a sheep's wool hat. It's extremely cold in Scotland at the moment, and I forgot to turn the heating on in this room, so it's either you look at my messy hair and I'm like shuddering and juddering all the way through the video, or we wear this lovely cosy hat that's actually from like a farm store up north in Scotland. It smells like genuine sheep, like it actually reeks like you're in some kind of barn on a farm, but it's super cosy, so highly recommend the full wool None of this fake synthetic shit, you know, full wool hat is the way to go if you live in a climate like this. Anyways, rule number one for better poker. 3-bet loose against weaker players. 3-bet loose when you have a skill advantage. This 3-bet is not ridiculous in theory. Like, it's probably, I don't know, close to break even. It could be like minus 2% of a big blind or something like that in game theory. And in real life, like, you'll probably find that your opponent doesn't fold very much here. Preflop, this is some kind of weaker player. GG Poker 100 Russian Cash has some regs in it, but it has quite a lot of recreational players. It's a pretty soft pull. And so we can imagine that Tom Durer, who's probably, um, this might be a, a reference to Tom Dwan, whose screen name was Durer, as we all famously know. This player is probably going to call a lot preflop, but they're not going to forbet a lot preflop. Our hand is going to have something like 50% equity against their calling range. So you may be wondering, well, where's the bang for your buck here? Why is this a good thing to do? And it's a good thing to do because of something called skill edge. And... The way to understand skill edge is that it is an absolutely massive behemoth factor. It's the kind of factor that can grossly outweigh any technical rake consideration, blocker consideration. It just doesn't matter like where a hand is on a range chart. As long as it's just outside of a 3-bit range, it's not like you're 3-betting 8 do substitute. Skill edge is going to make it good, especially if you're not having your equity denied on the first street by facing this 4-bit. So this is a play I'd highly recommend that you make. Mr. Tom Dwan here, not the real Tom Dwan, goes ahead and leads for half pot. As far as I can see, there's only one play here. We have an over, a backdoor flush draw to the nine. We have ace high, we have showdown value against mindless spew. We're obviously doing well enough to peel. I don't think raising at this SPR is even semi-sane. I think it's absolutely terrible. The reason being that this stack is going to be jamming a ton of stuff. Like if he has flopped a set here or a straight here or a flush draw or a pair plus a draw, like pocket eights or eight seven or something, you can imagine that the whole stack goes in the middle and we just raise fold ace nine and fail to realize any equity. That branch of the tree is so bad that it's well worth just avoiding that entirely. So call is really the only play here. We turn the nine, which is not really what we were hoping for, but it's okay. I think our hand is mediocre here. Fold equity from better hands. Really important that you're not making better hands fold by betting that turn. Well, maybe they fold like jack sometimes, but don't go for fold equity in this spot against a recreational player. You have showdown value now. You just want to check back, head towards showdown. And another really good rule, and this is coming up later, right? So I won't spoil it too much now, but when you face sizes like this where you're getting about three to one, you need about 25% equity to break even on a call. Like don't ever fold in these spots. Like forget entirely about what your hand actually is. As long as you can beat spew and bluffs and king queen and king jack and king 10 and stuff like that, which you can. And by the way, villain will also do this with like ace queen because recreational players have no concept a lot of the time about polarization. Folding here would be absolutely diabolical. It would be so bad that I'm not even going to say you don't deserve to play the game if you fold here because it's too much of an understatement, quite frankly. Pocket deuces. So the way this hand went down is kind of the proof that you should 3-bet ace-9 in the first place. Look at how Villain played here. Villain led half pot on the flop with deuces, checked the turn and then bet half pot on the river. Because recreational players are doing things like this, we're gaining so much EV by just being involved in the first place in these situations that we should be 3-betting super light. So if you're folding ace nine here, button versus cutoff recreational, you're actually just making a big mistake. And I'm going to just come out and say that. And you might not like it and you might prefer to follow your chart and you might wish poker was as simple as following a formula and winning, but it's not. You've got to figure out what actually affects EV and skill edge is one of the biggest things. Okay, moving on. Rule number two, slow play invincible hands at low SPRs. So that means when you're in a three bet pot, a four bet pot, you're against the short stack. Give them maximum room to do silly stuff. So here we have a situation where our opponent calls the three bet. We go for a small bet here, just gonna be betting a lot of our range as the squeezer. In this situation, I won't go into the reasons for that too much. 
you could build a checking range on this board, you could check aces as well, wouldn't be a problem. I would say that a6-5 isn't Poole's favourite board to go nuts on. They prefer to attack you on boards that aren't perceived to be as good for you as this, but some people will still overstab here. And against this raise, we have a very invincible hand. Like if Velen has 7-8 exactly, that's really the best hand they can have redraw-wise here. They still only have 6 outs, and at this SPR they're quite likely just to jam the turn, I think. So you could ask yourself, well, if I jam... What am I really achieving? I'm making them fold like some gut shot or making them fold 7-8 maybe or maybe they just have to call this off by now at this SPR. I don't know. It's close. Probably it's a call off. And then don't we just cause ourselves a lot of pain and anguish by jamming? Not pain that you actually feel. Not anguish that you can actually see. But if you actually think deeper here and imagine what are villains' other hands here apart from 7-8? Well, they can have like ace-5 or pocket fives or pocket sixes. And if that's the case, we're just going to stack them regardless of what happens. There's no universe where we don't stack those hands in just a minute's time anyway. But what if Villain has like jack 10 of spades? And what if you jam here? Well, they fold 100% of the time. And there could be many hands like that. We have no idea who this player is. We have no idea what they're capable of. If they have bluffs, the bluffs are probably very low EV for the most part. Not worth denying equity to. And if they have value, then we stack them anyway later. Now, if this is some fish that's got ace jack, it doesn't work to say if I jam, I think they're calling because you can get the money later anyway. Even if turn goes check, check, you have SPR one on the river, you can jam. So this is a low stack to pot ratio, a low SPR, and you should absolutely slow play here. And what I want to show you is that when you slow play here, you might get a conclusion that suggests that you should have played the hand otherwise. Sometimes when you play completely correctly, like this call on the flop is completely normal and fine. Now I think we jam. It's too likely now that Villain has no low equity draws left that are going to bluff River, but many hands that are either just bet calling off, you know, in a crying way like Queen Jack of Hearts, or some kind of hand we're coolering, like Ace Queen or Ace King or Ace Five or Pocket Sixes or something like that. So I think Jam is now the play. And sometimes like you're gonna jam and you're just gonna run into like the worst thing, and it's gonna be the highest equity bluff that Villain could have the 8-7 of hearts with the back door. The flush draw doesn't really matter here because, well, I guess the 5 of hearts isn't good for us anymore because that brings a straight flush. So that's a bit of an issue. If the 5 of hearts had come on the river there, I would have definitely thought that I'd won. Then I wouldn't be able to understand why the pot was being pushed to the opponent. Didn't notice that in game. But yeah, like don't take this to heart. Like Just the fact that he had this one combo here and it's debatable whether you should even jam flop against this combo, by the way, that is not the full picture. So definitely, definitely slow play at low SPRs when you have a nearly invincible hand. Nearly invincible. It's okay to lose a pot that you were winning. It's okay for your opponent to get there sometimes and beat you for a pot, for a stack. That's not the full game tree. This is unfortunate, but the lesson is clear. Slow play at low SPR. Rule number three, when you think your opponent is over bluffing, call with any hand at all that beats bluffs. Call with any degree of showdown value. It doesn't really matter if you're beating bluffs Stop thinking about your absolute hand strength. Stop differentiating between fourth pair, third pair, under pair, top pair, two pair. If Villain is repping a flush or a bluff, it's all the same. If you think they're over bluffing, you can call with anything. This is a four bet pot. I'll just go over the action here again. We three bet. Villain is some kind of recreational player, I believe. And they four bet. Really, really tiny. So six five suited is not happy here, but it's going to be one of our calls. It's going to be better to call and to fold this hand. If you fold this hand, you lose minus 7.5 big blinds. You're not going to lose that much by calling. You're going to lose something. So flop goes check, check. We turn, well, a gutter. Bad, bad gutter to go with our pair. But the thing is here, like, over pairs are just barely playing this way. This line from a recreational player is so typical of, like, ace-king, ace-queen. This is probably just ace-king, like, an enormous amount of the time. There are 16 unblocked combos of ace-king that are incredibly likely to play this way. There are 18 unblocked combos of overpairs that are incredibly unlikely to play this way. So you could reason that ace-king is probably there in full, whereas queens or something is discounted by like a ratio of four or something like that. Like there's only a quarter or a fifth of them remaining. This is just not the way that people play these hands. Okay, so this is basically a spot where our equity is, I don't know, like 65% or something like that. I just want to call though. I don't really feel like raising here, even though I do think I have the best hand the majority of the time. I just want to allow villain to continue bluffing. You could have some like weird scared hand as well, like I don't know, tens or something. It's possible. Or he freaked out with eights and four bet pre. I don't know. So he riffles the chips, you know, it's a sign of immense strength and then bets the typical weaker player size that is massively overbluffed. And the reason this is massively overbluffed and the reason the weaker player doesn't really acknowledge this is that they're not aware that when they bet third pot like this, that we need 20% equity to call. Is this third pot? Yeah, it's not far from that. It's a little bit more, but we need something like 22% equity, let's say, to call here, which means that only 22% of their range should be a worse hand than 6-5 because 6-5 is a bluff catcher. 
basically they need to have like a four to one value to bluff ratio here, which is completely, absolutely absurd. This is nowhere near. I think we're winning like 80% of the time in this spot. I actually think it's that over bluffed because like weaker players are not even for betting you preflop with king queen. Not really, but they are for betting sometimes with ace queen and quite a lot with ace king. They're much more linear. And ace king is 16 missed combos. There's no way that like aces or kings plays this way on flop or turn. If it did, it might merge river like this because they have no idea what they're doing, but it's not playing that way earlier. Straights are just like non-existent in a 4-bit range from a weaker player. They, this guy can't hand read his own range. He doesn't realize just how badly he's playing his range here and how badly he's playing his hand. So I expect to win. I didn't even think there. Have a look at how quickly I call that river. This is just such a no-brainer autopilot call for me. It's like taking candy from a baby that you don't even need to think. As long as you can beat that absolutely sprawling mess of bluffing combos, this is a call. And I'm not making this point to be like, oh, look how clever I am. I call 5-6. This is a brain dead call. There's absolutely nothing to think about here. But for beginners, they miss this. And I know that some of you guys are new to poker and I know that a lot of you guys are messing this up. And the reason you're messing this up is that you're looking at your overall hand and you're looking at the board and you're not hand reading. And the reason that a lot of you are not hand reading is that it's a lost art. It's like something we did in the pre-solver era. And then we all got obsessed with like copying six sizes in GTO Wizard instead. But hand reading is what allows you to just print money in this spot. That is the fastest call I've ever made, probably. That's just like, boom. I know what you have. Give me your money. So yeah, please, please don't obsess about your absolute hand strength here. Don't worry about the board. Hand read properly, street by street. Put your opponent on a range. Play accordingly. Rule number four is check to induce against short stacks at low SPRs. When you're against someone with this kind of stack, you obviously don't need to three bet as big as normal, but like, whatever, I'm just getting this in. Pre, I don't really care. I'm just going to make it like whatever sizing with nines. And then check call. Why is check call the only way that you should ever be playing the flop here? Because it is. It's the only way you should ever be playing the flop. And it doesn't matter what a solver says here. Obviously, this is completely absurd to even investigate this spot in a solver. Even looking it up is just an absolute waste of your time. If you look this spot up in a solver... Stop it! What are you doing? Going for check is important because your opponent gets here with a myriad of different hands with all kinds of properties. Some of those hands beat you, and if Felon has one of those at SPR1, you are going broke. Well, as insofar as losing $17.8 can constitute going broke. But you're going to put your money in, you're going to lose. If Felon has king-queen, that's tough shit. You're going to lose. Who cares? It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter how you do that. You could jam, you could bet one big blind, you could bet seven big blinds, you could bet 11. It doesn't matter. You're going to lose. You can't get away from it. If Felon has pocket sixes, you can put the money in or, or you can let them put the money in and you can put it in later. It probably doesn't really matter either. It's probably just much of a muchness. But here's where it does matter. If Felon has a flush draw, it really matters what... No, I'm just kidding. That doesn't matter at all. That's right, guys. The money goes in the same way against the flush draw. You bet, he bets. Who cares? Where it matters is if Felon has jack five of clubs or jack ten off or ace three or just some terrible hand. Because if you jam, that's like so bad on so many levels because your opponent's just going to fold the very bottom of their range sometimes. I've seen people call it off with 8-6 here because they're like, well, I have to gamble now and hope I hit a 6. But they're going to fold sometimes. Whereas if you check, well, how's this player feeling? They've just lost most of their stack. This is probably the only money on their poker account, I would guess, because they've not rebought. And they're probably ready to just be done with this and go and do something else. So unless you give them rope, they might be able to fold. But if you give them rope and you check, they're going to stick it in with almost any hand now. A very high frequency with like 5-4 and stuff like that. And you really want 5-4 to put the money in, not to fold. So definitely check to induce at very small stack depths against weaker players in spots like this. So important. Okay, we win that one. Nice. On to the next. Rule number five, use big turn probe sizing. In most of the spots where you're probing the turn, you may be asking, how the hell do we end up probing the turn with pocket sixes on King Jack 5? Good question. This hand would be a pure check. If it goes check, check here and the turn is not a six. Therefore, you can infer, my friends, ladies and gentlemen, that the turn was in fact a six in this hand or we would not be probing it with this showdown value hand, would we? No, that's right, we wouldn't. But what happens here is that when it goes check, check, I think we're timing out because like something happened on another table. Yeah, probably. I wasn't really in the tank about whether to lead sixes. I wasn't like, oh my God, should I lead sixes? Like staring at my opponent, like riffling my chips like an absolute idiot. Don't you hate it when you're watching like poker on TV and some bad player is like taking some stupid no-brainer spot uber seriously and then like commits a big polarization mistake by like donk bang? Don't you just hate it when that happens? No, is that just me? We have turned a six 
as you can imagine. And what happens when the flop goes check check is that your opponent has forfeited their nut advantage. They have lost nut advantage to a significant extent because we can infer that king queen, ace king, king jack, pocket fives, etc. are all betting the flop at nearly 100% frequency. We can also infer that villain has quite a lot of showdown value stuff. They may also be betting their low showdown value draws and backdoors and stuff like that at quite a high frequency as well. So their range is condensing, it's moving towards the middle. That doesn't mean that their range has terrible equity now. Like if you look this up in a solver, the solver will tell you that you're still at a disadvantage in terms of range advantage. That's in terms of equity. We talk about all of this in the Carrot Poker School, of course. This is actually grade two lecture one polarizing and condensing. If you want to check out what it's about, by the way, you can see the first five minutes for free. Just on Carrot Corner, we give you previews of all videos to try to entice you to spend your money. We're really clever that way. But yeah, we are in a spot where we have a nut advantage, but not necessarily a range advantage. And the way you play that spot in GTO proper is that you bet really quite infrequently, but for a giant sizing that facilitates huge pot growth, exponential pot growth when you do bet. And that's normal. And in reality, that's fine as well, because what you should really be doing here is building your betting range around a set or two pair or a good king and checking everything else and then bluffing sometimes with the big sizing as well. The flush card comes on the river. That's not really the point of the hand. You still have a value bet here. Your opponent's going to usually bet the flop with a flush draw. In real life, humans are very bad at checking a flush draw on the flop. They will have about a third as often a flush draw as they should in theory or something like that. And so this is still worth a lot of EV here. You could maybe even go pot here or something. I don't think we want to overbet anymore on this card because even though Villain doesn't have a flush that often, you're still going to shift your equity when called down a bit here by overbetting. You're going to struggle. Not that you'll be dead when called. My students really bug me when they say stuff like, oh yeah, if we overbet, we're only getting called by a better. It's like, no. No, that's too extreme. That's way too far. You're exaggerating. Chill out. It's not that you're only getting called by a better. What an absurd thing to say. But the truth is that if you overbet here, you might only be like a 53% equity favorite when called or 56% or something like that. And that's not very good. Whereas if we bet this size and get called, we might be like a 75% favorite. So it is going to contract villain's range a fair bit here, the difference between 23 and 33. Because one is an overbet and one is a normal sizing that villain's more used to facing. There won't be a big difference between 23 and 27 though, and that's why I think we could go closer to pot, but I'd avoid the overbet sort of bracket of sizing in this spot. We get looked up. By ace track. Happy days. Okay, rule number six. Do not fold versus small recreational sizing in any spot ever where you have showdown value, basically. You follow that rule, it'll probably stand you in good stead like 90%, 95% of the time. So we face a donk bet here on 997 rainbow. We have pocket queens. I would say that this range is extremely mergy. Probably kind of showdown or equity driven. So gut shot, 7x, pocket pair. Something that like wants to bet in case I have two over cards is very often going to be what villain has here. And then the snap click back. So when you look at this, it's important to distinguish what is like a fish clicking buttons, right? What's someone just like clicking a button and what is someone actually building a thought out three bet range? Because if you looked at like a three bet range here in a solver for donking and then three betting, it would be mostly trips and bluffs. So it'd be things like nine, like queen nine, jack nine, king nine, and it'd be stuff like jack eight suited and stuff like that, right? That would be the main gist of it, five, six or something. But in real life, it's nothing like that. It's not polarized like that. But I hear people in my Discord group post hands like this and be like, villain's action is highly polarizing. It's like, no, no, it's not. In theory, it's highly polarizing. But in real life, this could just be like tens that didn't three bet pre for some weird reason. It could be eights. It could be seven X. It could be a guy just going, I don't believe you and I'm going to raise without thinking about what my hand is. I induced you to do this, so now I'm going to raise. It can be all kinds of weird and wonderful thought processes, so don't fold. Don't level yourself into some like terrified fold here. You're getting like 5,000 to 1 peel. See what happens. Poker players love to say, so I uh, called here to reevaluate. No, no, you call here because you're getting amazing pot odds and you're still doing well overall. You will reevaluate, but that's not why you call. That's a silly reason to call. If you find yourself saying call to reevaluate, don't do that. It's bad. Okay, 13 bigs, again, small, silly sizing. At this point, I do have some concern that my opponent can have a nine and just be playing it super weird. But after the river check, I wonder if I should have gone for value here. I think I probably should have. I was in some kind of mode where I was like, see, like, I even did this myself. I was like, well, he's polarized by three betting the flop and betting the turn. But the sizing's so small. I really do wonder if, like, the 9x now that's played this way is just never betting that tiny on the turn and never checking river. It's certainly never doing both of those things. So I wonder if I can just like put Villain on a range of mostly like 
6-5 and 7-6 and 7-8 and actually just go ahead and bet the river like 38 big blinds. I probably should have. I don't actually like this check. This check is kind of bad. I'm surprised at myself for checking so quickly. Yeah, 10-7. Yeah, I really feel like I should have been way greedier here. I just don't think a 9 really does this. Kind of a brain dead check by me. That's really bad. That's really sloppy. I just spent a bunch of time arguing about why this is actually really rarely a 9. And then in game, my subconscious has been stuck in some mode of like, oh, he's too polar. So it's so easy done, right? Like even there, like I've made a mistake there, even though I know this concept so well. But it just shows you your in-game play and your out-of-game reasoning can be so different. Man, I left a lot of money on the table there, actually. Really surprised I checked that river. I didn't remember checking that river. Man, bizarre. Okay, anyway, moving swiftly on from that disaster. Okay, a rule number seven. If you've called earlier, turn the bottom of your range into a bluff on the river. If you've got the chance to bet, like probably not like donk leading. But if you've got a natural bet opportunity on the river and you've called a bet earlier on, then turn the bottom of your range into a bluff. So king eight here, we call flop, turns the queen of diamonds. It goes check, check. And then by the time we get to this river, we pretty much have one of the worst hands that we could have. I guess we can have under pairs as well. And maybe we can have ace high. So no, this probably isn't the bottom of our range, right? Maybe this is even a check in theory because it's got enough showdown value. And maybe in game I underestimated the showdown value of this hand a bit. But here's the thing. In practice, people are not checking back the turn with a flush, but they are meant to sometimes in theory. That's wild, right? But they are. They're not checking back with a nine, but they're meant to pretty often in theory. That's wild, I know, but it's true. And they're not checking back even with two pair as much as they should, which they're meant to check back a ton in theory. Because they're not finding these GTO checks, the fold equity for us here on the river is absolutely enormous. Because when we go ahead and do something like what we did here, all of the elements of this being a successful bluff are true. It's convincing, because we've filtered earlier. I could even go bigger here, actually. Yeah, I quite like a bigger bet here, in fact. Although this is fine, I do have just a ton of 9x, I do raise a lot of my flushes on flop here against that sizing, so maybe this is actually quite coherent. But anyway, it's, it's definitely convincing, because I've called earlier, it's 4 to a straight, it's also scary looking because people just don't like bluff catching on really messy, horrible board textures generally. And yeah, it's a spot where Villain is super capped and just has a weak absolute hand strength hand like King Queen or something really, really often. So I think this is a no brainer bluff because even if we are showing down for some of the pot here, betting is probably better. So the goal in poker is not to do something that's plus EV. And that's why we don't simply stop at saying I've got showdown value, therefore I check. We compare betting to checking. And if we're overshooting the mark considerably here, with respect to how much fold equity we need compared to what we're getting, then we should definitely be bluffing if we're getting way more fold equity than we need to break even. Because even if checking is winning a bet, it won't be winning as much as that bluff. All right, rule number eight, size your turn bet small when you're in a big pot at a low SPR. SPR keeps coming up time and time again today. It's a very important thing to react properly to. So here we squeeze a skin suited against under the gun, min open and a cold call from what's probably a very loose player. 66% VPIP running hot guy. This is a board that, if I thought these ranges were tighter, like if I thought this guy didn't have all the combos of 9, 7 of spades, then c bank here is a bit more dicey and you could probably revert to some kind of high check frequency strategy. But I think this is always a hand that's going to be fine to bet. And it's got some pretty good implied odds, redraw, double barrel potential, triple potential. There's some things that can go right here. So this player, the regular looking lower VPIP guy, decides to fold. Looks like his avatar is like a sticker album picture from like a 1994 football sticker book. Used to collect a bunch of those in 1994. I remember having like the Euro 96 sticker album, the World Cup 98 sticker album, the Scottish Premier League sticker album. Who remembers those days? Football stickers. Let me know in the comments. What a time to be alive going around trading with other kids in the playground. These days everyone's just on their phone like, like not even speaking to each other. What terrible world we live in, huh? Good thing I've got this nice cozy hat to keep me safe from it. Anyways, we have the chance to barrel the turn here against someone that looks like an absolute maniac, gambler kind of player that won't fold very much. So you could say this is debatable. And in GTO nerd language, we block the folding range. I don't actually care about that here. Like, okay, we block ace 10 of clubs, really. Like, are we even concerned with that? Do we even think this guy differentiates between backdoor flush draw and non-backdoor flush draw on the flop? Like, maybe not. Betting small here is the sizing, right? Because you get a lot of bang for your buck here. This small sizing lifts a lot of weight because you're basically saying to villain, 
I have bet a second time you have to decide whether to continue again and you are quote unquote applying pressure here and that's a horrible term just to use on its own without any theoretical understanding but what applying pressure kind of means if used correctly I think is that the bet implies more stuff than the actual size of the bet in the pot odds so with this turn bet here Villain has to think about the fact that well the river is going to be jammed pretty frequently my range is obviously really strong here I have a load of overpair and ace queen and stuff like that this guy doesn't give a shit he's just like I'm all in what are you going to do? And it didn't work this time. But yeah, we don't need very much fold equity on the turn there for that to be good. If this is a weaker player that is folding all of the combos of 6s, 7s, 9s, 10s, jacks, queens, we're giving ourselves, not queens, sorry, but under pairs in general, we're giving ourselves an incredible price just to make that happen. If they're also the kind of player that has like just ace high peeling the flop and decides to fold, we're also getting a really good price to make that happen. Sometimes people get kind of confused and think that at low SBRs they have to jam or something like, oh, it's too awkward to bet small, it's too unneat, it's untidy, I don't like it. But it's the right thing to do because you get a ton of leverage with this sort of bet. You get to send a message that generates fold equity for a very cheap price. And it's just a very good thing to do because as we know, humans are really inelastic. This is also theoretically the right sizing here, but that's not the point. It's very good exploitatively, which is the point. Rule number nine for better poker is call the turn with a five out bluff catcher. We begin this hand by smoking a cigarette. I don't smoke in real life anymore, so this is the only way I can feel cool these days. Isn't it wild that like kids that are being born today will probably like never smoke for the most part? I mean, it's great, but it's also kind of wild for our generation's point of view. Anyway, squeeze from a weaker player here. This rule is called call the turn with a five out bluff catcher. Generally speaking, a bluff catcher is a hand that beats all bluffs or is significantly far ahead of all bluffs but doesn't beat any value hands. That's the carrot poker school definition. And a five out bluff catcher is one like this that can improve two eights and three sevens and those outs are very, very strong here. They're great outs as long as villain doesn't have a boat already, a set already rather. So on the turn here, nothing much changes. We get pot odds that are not amazing but also not terrible here when we face this bet. This bet can still be some bluffs from preflop like ace, queen, ace, ten, ace, five, etc. It can also just be like ace king, aces, pocket jacks, but there's not a ton of value hands here. I mean, okay, there are, but there's also a ton of bluffs here too. And very often, like at three to one, what's going to happen here is that enough of the time you're going to bink an eight or a seven and win a huge pot, or you're going to just call the river bricks, fill and checks back ace queen and you win. Those two things occur enough of the time that for three to one, you should be making this call. But I see a lot of students fold here because they're like, I can't call two. I can only call one with third pair, third pair, not a good enough hand to call two, only one. And they're looking too much at their absolute hand strength, their hand ranking. They're not looking enough at the redraw. So even though we usually take the worst of it here and what happens in this hand is normally what happens that we just lose. You know, there's enough going on that for 25% required pot share, we should be calling that turn every single time with this hand. But it didn't work out this time. That's poker. It can't always work out. And finally, for rule 10, which is... Implied odds and future fold equity both matter when you're facing a bet. Don't just think about your price when you have a draw. This is a really common beginner leak where beginning poker players say I didn't have the odds and they perform some literal pot odds calculation. This is the three bet pot button versus small blind. This player is a reg. I think they're one of the more competent players in the pool. That doesn't say much, but they've not done anything yet that made me downgrade them to the bad reg tag. I make the bad regs brown. So if you see a brown tag, it's because you used to be yellow, but then you did something that basically implied that you didn't deserve to play the game, so you got the do not deserve to play the game brown tag. This sizing deep is not nice to face when you have this hand, and it's very easy to say I don't have the odds because I'm drawing to, let's say, nine clubs and three tens that aren't clubs, so I have 12 outs times two is 24, 25%, something like that. And to call a near pot size bet, I need like 31, 32% equity. So if you have that calculation, you end up folding here. And that's a gargantuan error, guys. It's a really, really colossal mistake because there's a few other things going on. When villain has aces or kings or queen x, which is what they're repping for value, and you hit a 10 or a club, you win more money on the river a pretty big amount of the time. It doesn't just stop there. Villain doesn't check fold ace queen on the river because you might have a flush especially if they have an ace of clubs blocker, but they don't anyway, genuinely. What happens in other branches of the tree here, and this is the branch people forget all about, is that if villain checks the river, they are very, very often check folding. Because if they have a queen or aces or kings, they're going to value bet again for the most part, especially with the queen. And if they have aces or kings, they might not even check call, but they probably will if they do check, but they might not check. So for the most part, if villain checks the river, they have give ups like ace 10, jack 10, ace king, etc., and we can just bet and take this pot down really, really often. So that's called future fold equity. 
The first part is called implied odds. Your pot odds matter as well, but the way to think about this is that you have about 25% equity here against non-boats and non-quads, and then you don't need that much more to get up to like the 32% to call in the implied odds in the future fold equity give you that boost to bridge the gap between your equity and your required EV to call. So remember that when it's pre-river, you're looking at EV, not equity. You're not just like doing some very basic math calculation you're actually computing all these other factors that are to do with the fact that there's still money left behind and action still to come here. So that's very important. We don't have to bluff when we river the nine because there's not much fold equity from better hands now. And I think check is clearly the winning play. And villain has ace four clubs, so we got very lucky there. We were drawing insanely dead. However, I think we still win this hand quite a lot even against this hand because in the real world we have loads of action still to come. Six clubs are out, only seven remain in the deck, and when villain checks the river with this busted flush draw as they inevitably will because people don't like bluffing this sort of combo, we just bet and we win. So even though we're quote unquote dead, we win this pot a ton because we have position and because we have that future fold equity and that's why it's so important not to get sucked into the I don't have the odds fallacy, but you're ignoring the factors that matter just as much. Implied odds future fold equity. Okay guys, this has been a fun video. It's actually the final YouTube video I'm recording in 2023. You're watching this in 2024, no doubt. So happy new year. I'll have taken a big long hiatus from poker, hopefully, and will have chilled out and played a load of team fight tactics and done some golfing, hopefully, if the weather permits. And I hope you guys have had a good holiday as well. For all of our stuff, it's carrotcorner.com. Our subscription service will be launching sometime in the spring. Loads more content on there for myself and other coaches as well. Check it out at Carrot Corner and we'll see you back here on YouTube. We'll be picking up the frequency again, going back to two or three videos a week like we did towards the end of 2023. See you there. Bye for now.